Um, now, the next speaker I'm bringing to the stage is actually someone who, uh, who actually inspired me. Uh, when I first started speaking, he was one of the persons who I actually saw on stage. Um, he's got a fantastic story. Justin Harrell created Attitude Inc., a clothing brand that became an international uh, licensing success that turned over in excess of $20 million per year. Named as in International Entrepreneur of the Year in 2005, he is one of Australia's most sought after speakers and trainers uh, with engagements uh, booked all over the country and also overseas uh, with audiences over 150,000 people. Now he is an amazing speaker, he has a great story, and he is one of, uh, one of the person that got me into the business. So can you please put your hands together, make some noise for Justin Harold. Please put your hands together for him. How are we going? Good. How many people in this room own a business? How many people in this room would like to own a business? As far as I'm concerned, the, the best way of wealth creation, if there is such a thing, hate that word, is um, owning a business. Um, because it's the only thing you can actually control. You can't control property, you can't control shares, um, where you can control a business. I'm going to tell you my story and how I did what I did, why I did what I did, and all that sort of stuff. Um, but before I do, has anyone ever seen the Muppets? Yeah. Remember the two old farts that up the top that didn't like anyone? There's always two in every audience when I speak that just don't like me. I don't care, just in case you're wondering. But just in case you are one of those Muppets and you're thinking to yourself, well, what's your business credentials, Justin? I thought I'd give you my business credentials right from the start and we can go from there. I've never done a profit and a loss, I've never done a forecast, never done a budget, never borrowed money and never had an overdraft and the only thing I passed in school was recess. So <laughs> that's my business credentials. But what I did do is I got off my rear end and gave it a crack. It's unfortunate these days a lot of people would like to make more money and have a better uh, lifestyle but they don't want to actually work for it. Um, if success was easy everyone would be successful. So it's not easy. But you can have fun along the way. The one thing that you'll understand by the time I'm finished is I have fun. Um, doing everything and I haven't changed anything about who I am you ever met those people that they you know were really fun and then they became a businessman you go what the hell happened to you overnight so I'm not I'm going to do any of that I'm not going to tell you how to suck eggs if your business is currently working then that's great if it's not then obviously you got to do something different my secret to success is pretty deep this this is about as deep as I'm going to get today but if what you're currently do is working then you're doing it the right way and if it's not working you're doing it the wrong way and you can actually gauge that on a daily basis and a weekly basis and a monthly and a yearly basis. That way you can change. Because my favourite four letter word is next. So if things aren't working for me, I'll go and change it a little bit by bit. Now there's many reasons why people go into business. Some people go into business because they want a better lifestyle. Some people go into business, I don't understand this one, but they want to be the master of their own destiny. Um, I sat next to a numb nut on a plane recently. I hate sitting next to people on planes because if they're stupid, you're stuck with them. <laughs> so I try not to talk to anyone when I'm on a plane, just in case they're stupid. But this one time I was on the front cover of the Voyeur magazine, which I was speaking a while ago, and a lady thought the Voyeur magazine was a magazine about people looking through people's windows. <laughs> I'm in that one too. But, um, so it's the Virgin magazine. So anyway, I get on the plane and I sit down, and the guy next to me goes, I know who you are. And I said, that's good to know. And he said, I started a business too. I said, that's fantastic. I said, why did you start a business? And he said, I wanted some spare time. Freaking idiot. <laughs> we didn't talk much after that. <coughs> so your reason is your reason for starting a business. The reason I started a business was pretty simple. My father is a minister, which I know you were probably thinking that because I look so angelic today. But my dad was the head of the religion when I was growing up, which I've got no dramas with all of that. But the problem I've got with being a minister's kid is that everyone inside the church Thing, seems to think it's their job to tell you how to live your life. And the problem I've got with that is um, I've got a rare disease, which is I speak before I think. And people would come up to me when I was young and say, Justin, you've got this problem in your life. And I'd say, look, you really suck in your own life. I'm not sure why you're telling me what to do. Yeah. Which apparently you don't say that to ministers' wives, I've learned <laughs> pretty quickly. But anyway, 1995, I was 25 years old. 1995, a lady came up to me and she said, Justin, you've got an attitude problem. I said, no, I don't. She said, you answer everyone back. I said, no, I don't. 
And she said, until you stop doing that, you're going to end up on a scrap heap of, of the world. I'm not sure what a scrap heap is. We're holding a pissed off people somewhere in some part of the world. I'm not sure. My business plan, if I ever had one, was this time. I just thought, I thought, if I can get my mates to wear my attitude problem on the back of a T-shirt, they can go to church for me on a Sunday and piss her off by proxy. So I don't ever have to go anymore. You know, sometimes the people who haven't started a business, who would like to start a business, sometimes it's the silliest things that can be the thing that can catapult you down the, the path. If we all came in, I use a lot of analogies when I speak, but if we all came into this room and the lights were off, all we've got to do is find the switch to flick the, the switch to turn the lights on, correct? That's the same thing when it comes to getting to the next level of your life. You don't have to go and plan it all out. Find the switch. What is the thing? You might be pissed off because no one's, you not have, don't have enough money. People keep telling you you can't achieve something. Whatever it is, what's that switch? For me, it was a stupid woman telling me I, that I had an attitude problem. So I thought, you know what? I want to upset her the next Sunday. That was all I wanted to do. That's the only reason I started my business was just wholly and solely to upset this woman. Then I was going to come up with another idea the following Sunday to upset her in a different way. So... <laughs> So I thought, well, you know what, I'm going to go start a business. So I went and did my uh, financial research. So I went to the local ATM machine, I put my key card in the ATM machine, and at age 25 I had $1.25 in the bank, which you can't upset someone with $1.25. So I rang up my little brother Dean, I said, Dean, I need to borrow some money. He said, why? I said, because I want to piss off so-and-so in Dad's church. He goes, all right, he's 50 bucks. <laughs> Sweet that, I was filthy rich. So then um, I did my market research. My market research was pretty simple. I had a Mini back in those days, but I had no petrol in the Mini, and I didn't want to use my working capital for fuel. So my parents gave me $5. Now, if you've ever owned a Mini, $5 gets you a very long way. So my research was how far will they get me and back, and how many printers are in that area. There was one. So I rang up Marty. Marty's one of my best mates. We used to do nothing together. We are really good at it. I said, I'm going to start a business today. And he goes, do you know how? I said, no. Nah. He goes, can I come along and watch then? <laughs> oh. So we went out. I said this before, I'm going to say it so many times while I'm speaking, you've got to make sure you're having fun on a daily basis in, in life. Like, if you own a business and it's dreary, boring, tiresome, you regret it every day, sell it and go work for someone else. You've got to have fun. There's got to be an advantage, not only a financial advantage, but there's got to be more than a financial advantage if you're owning your own business. So we went out to this printer. And I walked in and I said, hello, mate, I've chosen you out of every single person in the yellow pages, which wasn't a lie. I just couldn't afford to go to anyone else. I said, I want you to be to my printer. And he goes, that's fantastic. I said, I'm thinking the same thing. He said, how much money do you have? I said, I've got 50 bucks. He goes, well, you need $680 for the setup. I said to him, listen, if I had $680, I just would have said to you, mate, I have $680. But as I said to you, mate, I have $50. Can we just have this $50 conversation, not the $680 conversation, please? <laughs> And he said, I can't do it. I said, you have to. And he said, but I can't. I said, you need to. And he said, I can't. I said, but you're missing the opportunity. And he said, what opportunity? I said, to make 50 bucks, mate. It's a pretty simple conversation at this point in time. <laughs> he goes, I'll do it, but never tell anyone. And I still remember saying back then, who's ever going to listen to me talk anyway? So anyway, he printed them up. Attitude started off as a slogan t-shirt company. Slogans such as, it's all about luck, just ask any loser. Um, I don't have an attitude problem, you have a perception problem. Uh, sarcasm is just another service I provide, stuff like that. <laughs> Sold three of those shirts to three of my mates, one of them was my brother, and Dean said, I, I just gave you 50 bucks, why do I have to pay you 20 bucks for a shirt? <laughs> I said, because I'm a businessman, Dean, this is the way it works. <laughs> we all went to church the following Sunday, we all walked in at the same time, we all sat on the front row and we all had the same t-shirt on, and this lady walked in and she was ticked. It's the best 50 bucks I've ever spent in my entire life. <laughs> now I wasn't expecting much from that. I say some stuff that some people go, that's demotivational, but I'm actually a realist. Sometimes, I believe, I sit down and mentor a lot of business owners now, which I thoroughly enjoy, but there's a lot of people that are actually aiming too far out and trying to aim too big right at the start, and they wonder why it doesn't work. It was never going to work that way anyway. You're not going to get a Ferrari in your first year. Just letting you know that. Um, where people, well, I'd rather try to achieve a goal, how big or small it is irrelevant, because then I've achieved something. There's a result that I've got in my hand. The feeling of that result is the thing that makes me want to do another result. So if you make them too big, you're going to be disappointed all the time. So I wasn't expecting anything from it. I just wanted to piss the lady off and come up with another idea the following weekend. And on that day, people come up and said two things that I wasn't expecting. Number one, love your T-shirt. I said, thank you. Number two, can I buy one? I hadn't thought that far ahead. 
I said, I suppose you can. And the only time I'll talk about figures is now, just to show you how it went, and we'll get back to here. My three shirts I sold could make six shirts, sold those six could make 12, 24, 48, 96. I'm a very big believer if you want to start a business or grow a business, do it organically. Don't spend any money on it, just see how it goes first. My first year's turnover was the $50 startup, was $980,000. Second year was two and a half million, five and a half million, twelve and a half million, twenty two and a half mil. And the last year I had the business was 37 and a half mil. So went okay. The good thing though about $37 million, besides the cars, love cars. I love cars. Aston Martin. Love cars. Normally I get women saying, I don't get the car thing. I don't get the shoe thing. But anyway, the good thing about $37 million besides the whole car thing was it became an international brand. So now, wherever that lady goes on holidays throughout the world, <laughs> I'm pissing her off globally now. It's fantastic. So anyway, we'll get back to this day. So I, I started to sell to my friends and started to sell to my mates and my friends and friends of my mates and my mates and my friends. And that's the way that I sort of started the business. So if you haven't started a business, the reality is you won't really know what to do. People go, well, I can't do anything now because I don't know what to do. I don't get that. Do something. And you might find you've got a natural, I found I had a natural ability to run and grow a business. It was something that was just very natural. Like, I failed school miserably, but running businesses, easiest thing I've ever done. So after a while, I ran out of people that liked me. So I thought, I can't really sell to people that don't like me. So I thought, what do I do? And I'm an ideas man. So I thought, brilliant idea. There's shops out there that sell clothing. And I have clothing that they could sell. Brilliant. I need to see one of these shops. So I did. I live in Sydney. Walked into this shop in Sydney, and this is the conversation I had with the first retailer. Walked in, said to the guy, G'day, mate, I'm from Attitude. He goes, I've never heard of it. I said, well, you wouldn't have, because I haven't told you about it yet. <laughs> and he said, well, no one's asking for it. I said, they're not asking for it, because they probably haven't heard of it. And if they had heard of it, you still haven't heard of it. So they ask you for it, you haven't heard of it. So you know what they're talking about. So let me tell you about it. At least if they ask you for it, you go, I've heard of it. <laughs> and he goes, well, there's no demand. I said, there's no more demand, because no one's freaking asking for it, mate. No one's asking for it. You won't let me tell you about it. How about I tell you about it? You maybe put it in your store, probably right at the back where no one can find it anyway. And then one day, someone's come in your store and say, mate, do you have a, uh, any new stock that I've never even heard of before? Any brands? And you go, oh, yes, I do, right at the back of my store. And you're going to go and show them, and they're going to say, I love that shirt. Where did you get that shirt? Oh, let me buy that shirt. And you're going to go, cha ching, yes, you can. They're going to wear it to the mate's barbecue, probably about three weeks later. And the mates are going to say to them, love that shirt. Where'd you get that shirt from? And they're going to say, from your surf store. So they're going to come into your surf, surf store probably about a week after that and say, my mate bought a shirt from you about three weeks ago. I'd really like to buy the same sort of shirt if that's okay, which is what we call demand but we can't get to demand because you're an idiot and you won't let me tell you about it <laughs> you know what he said to me when does the demand come back and see me has anyone ever met an idiot <laughs> oxygen thieves you know those ones that you sit there and go how the hell are you on this planet you might have those customers like you just you know you sit there like statues they are so anyway it's illegal to hit stupid people anymore. We're not, we're not allowed to do it. But the next time you're in front of a numb nut that's doing your head in, oh, this is the number one thing people email me and go, hey, that really works. But the next time you're in front of a stupid person, in your head, give them a mental headbutt. It's gonna make you feel so much better about everything, right? You can virtually break their nose. So I left that store all dejected. Does anyone, rem the older people in this room would, but do you remember Muttley? <laughs> Muttley. So I'm walking back to my car, <laughs> having my pity party. I'm great at pity parties. You know, doing the whole, oh, success is supposed to be easy. Oh, yeah, how easy is it really? Having this whole conversation. I get to my car and I sit into my car and I had an epiphany. I don't know how to spell it, but I know I had one. <laughs> Up until that point, I was listening to every single person tell me, I'm going bald. Um, up until, <laughs> sorry, it's just the way my head works. You don't really see the back of your head that often, do you? Um, up until the point I was listening to every single person tell me how I should be running my business. Now you probably, the people who are in business and the people who aren't even in business would probably have people around you that are telling you how to suck eggs on a daily basis. Your friends, your relative, your husband, your wife. You know, and they suck at what they do. Like, they don't even own a business, but they're telling you what you should be doing. You know, I've got a 21-year-old daughter, and I think we all need to sort of apply what she has got going for it. It's called selective hearing. 
Um, so just because someone has an opinion, we come up with a T-shirt as an attitude one. When I want your opinion, I'll give it to you. Um, just because if you know, someone leads off a conversation, well, if you want my opinion, no, I don't. Don't listen to what everyone tells you. Like at some point in time, we have to make our own successes and our own mistakes. I'd rather make my own mistake than someone else's stupid opinion or stupid advice's mistake, because they're never around once you make you do it, and then it doesn't work, and they're gone. So I thought, you know what? I'm doing all this thing wrong. I'm listening to every single person around me tell me what to do. And it was at that minute, my epiphany, that I figured out that all my mates that were doing that were on the dole. Hmm, don't think they know what they're talking about. So I decided from that day and that day on, and I've never gone away from it, is to run my business one way and one way only. This is, as Oprah says, this is not an aha moment. Um, this is everything I'm going to talk about today is very basic and common sense. Common sense isn't common anymore, unfortunately. I decided to run my business wholly and solely through my personality. That's it. Now, if you don't have a personality, we are selling them at the door on the way out. Two for the price of one. Everyone has a personality. Most people, I'm not sure if you've ever been to a shop, maybe retail, and you could swear they left theirs at home that day. Like you go, eee. But if we take us to work, if we grow our businesses and do our businesses through who we are, see, people buy from people they like. You might have the best product under the sun, but if you're a narky, yucky person, no one's going to buy from you for very long. If you don't have the best product under the sun, but you're a very likable person, people will get behind you because they like you. So I thought, you know what, I'm just going to use who I am. And who I am is I'm never serious. If you say you really shouldn't go and do, well, I'm going to go and do that. I'm very spontaneous. I just do whatever and go, oh, crap, I shouldn't have done that. So I thought, well, I'm going to run my business that way. And if it works, I've had fun. If it doesn't work, I've had fun. The fun factor, I cannot stress it enough. Right? You've got to, have, you've got to enjoy the journey. So anyway, I thought, we'll do it my way. So I was sitting in the car park at this surf store, and I ring up four of my mates. I said, I need you guys to come over tonight. They said, why? I said, because I'm having a board meeting, because I'm a businessman. So they came over that night, they said, what's up? I said, I want one of you to ring this surf store once a week and this is all I want you to say. Week one, ring, ring. Hello, do you have any attitude gear? No, we don't. <laughs> week two, do you have any attitude gear? No, not yet. Week three, do you have any attitude gear? And the guy goes, no, but a few people have been asking for that brand. Really? Week four, do you have any attitude gear? And the guy goes, no, we're waiting for the rep to come back in. There's such a demand for his product. There's no demand, it's me and my four mates ringing up the same place. <laughs> So we've got to start listening to what people are saying, especially in business. Our customers will tell us how they would like to be sold to if we listen. If you keep yipping and yapping all the time and don't let them talk, they won't give you the heads up on how they want to be sold to. I didn't hear this guy say I don't like it. I heard him say no one's asking for it. And we'll get people to ask for it then. Seems to make common sense to me. So, went in the following day. Two brothers, which I didn't know, owned this store. I saw one brother the first time. The second time, the second brother was there, which was good for me. So I walked in, had my bag and everything with all the stock and stuff in it. Walked in, put it on the ground. Said, G'day mate, I'm from a brand, I'm wondering if I can talk to you about it. He goes, what's it called? I said, oh, you probably haven't heard of it, it's called Attitude. He goes, stop. I said, what? He goes, everyone is asking for your brand right now. <laughs> <laughs> Just me and my four mates. I call it the third party influencer. You, people who have already got a business will understand this. There's a lot of times the third party people, other people will get in the way. Their decision making process is stupid. There's no reason behind it. It could be the same as um, I every now and again ask, get asked to speak in like network marketing and MLM type places. And it's bizarre because th those people whinge and complain average Joe Blow, that they're not making enough money, would love to make more money, and then they get an offer that they could potentially make more money and go, that's nah, not for me. You can't, yeah, stupid people. I like stupid people because they make me look smart without me doing anything. <laughs> it's fantastic. Um, so, and this is so, a lot of times in business, the whole, it's not really about selling, it's about trying to understand where the other person's head's at. And most of the time it's not anywhere that's that relevant anyway. So to get around their objection is pretty easy. I ended up, I'm just going to skip forward for five seconds with a principle. For, I ended up, this is a sales principle. Um, coming up with what I put in my car, and I called it an objection journal, which was a piece of paper. Journal sounded really cool. Um, and every time I got an objection, I'd write it down. So that's what I had to overcome the next person. So the first guy said to me, no one's asking for it. So the second store I went into, hi, I'm Justin Harrell from Attitude. No one's probably asking for my brand. I overcome the objection. 
Hey guys, I've already done my ordering. Third store. Hi, I'm Justin Herald. No one's probably asking for my brand called Attitude. You've probably already done your ordering by now. Fourth store. And then you go, oh, you know, we, we, we only buy, um, we've got no money. Hi, I'm Justin Herald. This is the fourth store. Uh, you've probably never heard of my brand. No one's probably asking for it. Uh, you've probably already done your ordering. Uh, and my minimum order is only one shirt. So by the time you get to, if you start listening to the objections, whether they're right or wrong is irrelevant. These are objections that you need to overcome. So if you've got an answer for every objection straight away, you can get past people's stupidity, you know. So anyway, he pulled an order in this guy for $1,587. It was time for financial retirement back at that day for me. It was pretty cool. Sold out in two and a half weeks, mind you. So I was onto something. Tried to get into more stores and had a bit of success, but nothing major because no one's asking for it. I mean, uh... So I thought, what do I do? A, a lot of the time, it's unfortunate people who have got an idea for a business, which I love helping people get that idea into the market, but people who've got an idea for a business, they give up too quick because people say no. There's more than one or two ways to get a business or to get towards success. There's probably a gazillion ways. You, your job is to find what it is. It's the same as a jigsaw growing a business. You've just got to find the pieces that fit together. There's a lot of pieces that don't. So I tried to get it in, couldn't work, and I thought, what do I do? And I had to figure out. See, I'm um, very big on, here comes the demotivational thing, strategic quitting. Sometimes things aren't going to work. That's just the reality. It's not going to work. You know, sometimes you're going to have to really work hard at some stuff to make it work. You know that, that saying, you can't fit a square peg in a round hole? You can if you force it. So sometimes you're going to have to force it, but sometimes things just won't work. So I had to figure out if this thing's going to work or not. The retailer, bit of an idiot. So I had to see if the consumer liked my product, because if they liked it, well, I'll just sell to them. So I decided to go to a place in Sydney called Parkley Markets. Anyone ever heard of Parkley Markets? It's the largest markets in the Southern Hemisphere. There's nothing else in the Southern Hemisphere, really, but that's it. <laughs> so anyway, I rang up Marty, said, do you want to come? He goes, nah. I said, I'll pay you 100 bucks a day if you do. And he goes, I'd love to come and support your dream, Justin. <laughs> So we went out. I just wanted to see if people liked it, because if they didn't like it and the retailer was really hard to get it into, I was thinking, well, I'll just do something different, you know? So we got there. It was $87 for the weekend. They provided you with a trestle table. There was no, like, girly cloths over the top, just a trestle table. Now, I had never done anything like this before, so I didn't know what to do. So Marty goes, what do we do? I said, I don't know, just chuck the shirts on the table, I suppose. So we got the boxes and just tipped them all on the table. It wasn't in sizes, it wasn't in styles, it was just a big pile of clothing. <laughs> nine o'clock, basically, people start coming through. Quarter past nine, sold out. There were lines and lines and lines of people waiting to buy my T-shirt. Halfway through the selling frenzy, Marty turns to me and he goes, I think they think it was someone else. So, <laughs> shock the living daylights out of me. The one person you need to impress on a daily basis and shock is not your customers, is not your competitors, is not your partners, is not your staff, it's yourself. You've got to sit there and go, oh crap, I didn't know I could do that. Because the only time you'll grow your comfort zone is when you're out of it, not when you're in it. So it, it took off in the markets big time. Now I've got a brother, and I'll talk about Dean later on, and, and he's done really well in business. I've got a sister, she does nothing. But um, <laughs> the one thing that my parents always taught us as kids is there's always someone smarter on the planet than you, and your job in life is to find that smarter person if you want to get ahead. Shocks me on a daily basis how many people in business do not have a mentor. I'm not big into coaches, um, but have a mentor, someone who's actually been down a path they're trying to go down. I've got many. Um, I pay a fortune to my people um, who mentor me because they've been down a path that I don't want to, or made mistakes that I would rather not do. So I'd rather um, learn from someone that's been there instead of try and do it all myself. So that being the case, I, in the back of my head, I was always listening to my father, someone smarter, there's someone smarter. So I thought, you know what, I need to find someone smarter because I'd never done this whole selling thing before. So I'm in the markets one morning and there was a guy opposite that had been in the market for years and years and years. So I went over to him one morning before everyone came in, an old bloke. And I said, g'day mate, I mind if you can give me some advice. And he goes, yeah, 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 you're destined to fail. <laughs> Thank you. Now thinking that he's a smart bloke, I said, why is that? He goes, it's a fad. I said, I don't even know what a fad is, but it seems to be working. Sometimes you'll get asked or you'll either ask for advice or someone will give you advice that will not ring true to the current situation that you're going through. That means you don't listen to it any further. Just the heads up there. If it's not in correlate, like, unless it's going to build it, but if it's going, no, your thing's not going to work and your thing's working, 
that person's got no clue. So I didn't know this at the time, so I said, maybe he knows how to read the customer. I said, so, um, oh, then, then I said, as you were talking, people start coming in. I said, well, here come some people. He goes, I wouldn't serve them. I said, well, I've just started in business, but I reckon I know why you're not selling anything if you're not going to serve anyone. Thinking then he knows how to read the customer. I said, well, why not? And he goes, they've got no shoes on. Has anyone ever been again to Parkley? You don't get dressed up to go to Parkley Market, right? And I said, I'll serve them. He goes, why would you serve them? I said, because I've got no shoes on. Seems to make sense to me. <laughs> I noticed back then, and it's getting even worse now, the amount of people that judge their customers by the, what they look like, um, what they wet, dress like, how their hair's done. Like, it costs a lot of money to look like a dag these days, so you can't really judge anyone based upon what they wear, which is something very close to my heart. Because apparently I'm a terrorist. Don't come through an airport with me, just giving you the heads up. I get stopped every single frickin' time. I've tried the smiling, not smiling, head down, head up, dressed up, naked. I've tried everything, <laughs> right? And I get done all the time. Now, I'm not sure about Melbourne, but in Sydney, and this is not a joke, it is illegal to use humour in the airport. How freaking funny is that? I found this out. I got to the airport a while back, went through, put my bags in, whatever, at the corners thing, went through the metal detector. Guy stops me, goes, can I stop you for a random search? I said, it's not random. He does it all. And have you noticed I look at you like surprised? You got enough? <gasps> You're fine. Anyway, I went through. No, I smoke. And yes, it's bad for you. Don't need to hear it. So I went outside to have a smoke, come back through, same guy stops me. I said, you're kidding me? He goes, no, it's random. I said, it's not random. <laughs> Nothing. Went through. Then my plane was delayed. So I went back outside. <laughs> but in Sydney airport, the Qantas one, there's two ways you can go through the metal detector. I'm thinking, ah, that one. So I went through that one. Same guy's there. I'm thinking, he's seriously not going to. So I'm doing the whole. He goes, sir, can I? I said, you are kidding. He goes, it's random. I said, it's not random. <laughs> he said, then he said, do we have a problem? I said, we had the problem the first time. He freaking stopped me, mate. And we're starting to do it. I said, can I ask you a question? He goes, what? I said, have you ever looked at anyone that's done bad stuff through an airport? He goes, what's your point? I said, do they look like me? Bald head, goatee, tattoos. Standing out like dog's nuts? I said, no. They look like normal people that you're letting through now because you're waiting for the bald-headed peck ahead to come up the aisle every single time. I got taken to a, a room, and for 45 minutes, I was given a lecture on the dangers of using humour in an airport. <laughs> now, you try and sit there for 45 minutes without smiling once. But it's amazing how many people still to this day judge their customers based upon what they think they should look like, fit like, whatever into your business. If you've got a hand or a pocket, you're a customer as far as I'm concerned. So, you know, everyone has got, and, and I, my best asset in business are my competitors because they suck more than I do. And that's all you've got to do in business is make sure your competitors are sucking more than you. Not about you being unreal, just the start, really simple. They've got to be worse off and worse than what you're operating as. And then you look good. So anyway... I'm thinking, I'm not even going to listen to you. So I thought, you know what? I've got to come up with a point of difference. And my point of difference is in the markets is I need to give people an experience. Because you don't get that when you go shopping these days, especially in the markets. So we want to make sure that we make people feel so comfortable, regardless of whether they buy or not. And we had fun. Like All my friends and I, we're like, we have fun all the time. So we include everyone in our funness. But we have fun. So to the point where had a huge following, and then after a while, people started saying the same thing all the time. If you've got customers that keep on saying the same thing, don't dismiss it. That, that's a good way, that's, you know, customer feedback is a great way to change your business. But anyway, and the thing was, they said to me, Justin, I love your stuff, but I can't find it anywhere but here in the markets. And I say, listen, you won't find it in sports stores, I'm not a sports brand. You won't find it in surf stores, I'm not a surf brand. You won't find it in Australian-only stores because I'm not an American brand. You won't find me anywhere. But if you wouldn't mind doing me a favour. Now, these people would have either bought nothing, um, a $5 sticker, a $10 hat or a $20 T-shirt. Didn't bother me. 
what it was. But I'd say to them, listen, can you do me a favour? Now, this is back to the personality thing. If you're a nice person, people will do stuff for you. The reason most people's customers never help them grow their business is two reasons. One, Number one, they're just not nice people. But number two, um, they never get asked. So I just said to them, listen, can you take some of my business cards? And the next time you're in a surf sport, whatever store that you think that my product would be good for, can you just give one to the owner of the business? And just say to them, listen, I do a bit of work for this brand which you've never heard of called Attitude. I'm on holidays at the moment, so I've got no stock on me, but I know that the brand would be perfect for your store. Now, I was the guy, uh, and then they'd, then they'd ring me. So on average, I pick up between 15 to 25 stores every single week, purely based upon my consumer and customer going out there to grow my business. Now, I was the guy going to go ring them to get the appointment. I was going to go there and see them. I was going to come back and pack the box. I was going to go and deliver the box. I was going to ring them up in American accent from the accounts department. I was a one-man band. But on average, as I said before, 15 to 25 stores every single week I'd pick up purely based upon my consumer doing it. I now use that same principle now on Facebook. Um, I've got a new brand, which is oh, in 18 businesses now, but one of my new brands is a sunglass brand called Intimidate. Attitude, Intimidate. Um, and I put on Facebook a while back um, this is the power, and, and Lou's going to talk about social media stuff later on, but the power of social media, how many people use Facebook for your business here? Now on that, can you just leave your hands up? Is that a business page? If, if it's a business page, put your hand, uh, sorry, if it's a personal page, keep your hand up. So just business. Now, I'm a very big believer in having people follow what I'm doing. I'm the business owner. And I've got, and it's, it's good um, market research, Facebook. I'm not sure if anyone else has seen that. You can see what people do or don't like. But I've got, there's a Justin Herald fan page, um, which I think there's 1,500 people on. But my Justin Herald personal page is 4,600 people on. So I just sit there and go, oh, people want to deal with me on a personal basis. So I then become quite personal. Not too personal. There's no naked photos. I had to take them down. I've got in trouble. But... Um, <laughs> So I might have photos of two, my two daughters on there or I might say it's Harley time when and people like my Harley um, or I'll say I'm speaking here or I'm doing this or whatever. One post I put up, we sold 900 pairs of sunglasses in 45 minutes. You know what I said? This is the power of it all. Really looking forward to packing my new sunglass brand today. That's it. No name, no website, no nothing. You can lead a horse to water, you can't make him think. Your role as a business owner is to make your customers think the way you want them to do. See, if, as I said before, success was easy, everyone would be successful. I don't think success is that hard if we start doing it the way that we would like to do business. So the whole thing was, and it was a bet that I had with one of my mates, that I could, show, I could get people to, on a journey, and once they go on a journey, they'll buy. So what they had to do is go and figure out what is his new sunglass brand. So that leads a Google thing. Up comes the Intimidate website. There's the sunglasses, then all this work as if they're not going to buy. Funny thing was, I was saying this to Lou before, funny thing was, 60% of people of those 900 weren't on my friends list. They were friends of friends that got involved. So we've got to start using, I'm all about using free stuff. I, I'm not a big fan of spending money on business stuff because I'm not sure about anyone else. I actually like the money in my own pocket. The only reason I started Intimidate um, I'm all about, I like stuff, and just in case there's the Muppet in the room going, oh yeah, it's all about your stuff. I also build orphanages too, so up your jumper. Um, <laughs> but I'm all about stuff. The reason I started Intimidate, I sat on a very expensive pair of sunglasses and thought, oh, I don't want to buy another pair. Hmm. And I want a Harley. Hmm. I'll start a business. That was it. Uh, that was my market research. Um, <laughs> and my business plan all in one. Um, and three weeks later, I went and bought a Harley. If you aim at nothing, you hit it every day. So you've got to have something to aim at. I'm a very big believer. If you're going to have goals, they've got to be tangible goals. got to be stuff you can touch. Not, I want to become successful. What's that? I know successful people have got no money in the bank. Doesn't make, money doesn't make us the man. Uh, you see, if you give a dickhead a million bucks, you know what you got? A dickhead with a million bucks. Nothing's changed. So money is not the, the driving force for me, and I don't think it should be for anyone. So anyway, the markets took off. And I'm sitting in my garage one day, it was great. I used to run my whole business from my garage when I first started, which was good because I live in Sydney, so t with Sydney traffic, it took me six and a half seconds to get to work. So I'm sitting in my garage one day and the phone rings and the lady says um, on the phone, she goes, hello, it's the Alan Jones radio show. Now I got excited because the only Alan Jones that I knew was the Formula One motorcar racing driver. <laughs> 
I love cars. I'm thinking, this is sweet. I am going for a drive. She goes, no, not him, the other Alan Jones. I said, who's Alan Jones? Because I was 25, and back in those days, you didn't listen to Talkback Radio. I know I'm getting old now, because you know what I listen to? Talkback Radio. I can prove how I'm getting old. I carry a hanky. <laughs> and I've got a bald spot. Um, anyway, so she explained who Alan Jones was, and I said, oh, do people listen to Talkback Radio? She goes, oh, it's very popular. I said, well, not really, because I've never heard of it. She goes, well, he wants you to come in tomorrow. Well, I said, why? You know why? Someone that I served in the markets knew someone else that knew someone else that knew someone else that knew Alan Jones. They used to call that six degrees of separation. They actually say it's now three degrees of separation with this whole social networking thing. I, I, just on that social networking thing, I put a thing on there. I, I love little experiments, but I put... Well, most of my speaking's corporate, so I don't do many public things, so like at Pepsi's and Microsoft's and IBM's sort of conferences is what I normally do. But um, I put a, a post up probably about six months ago saying if you work in a company that is doing a conference and they're looking for a speaker, can you just give me the name of the person I need to talk to? That's it. If I get the speaking job, I'll give you 10% of my speaking fee. Picked up 15 jobs in a day. You know, we ought to start using this whole stuff to our advantage. Sometimes you can be very blunt on what you want with Facebook. I am. Um, anyway, she goes, um, so he wants to do an interview tomorrow morning, 10 past 7. I said, well, I can't. I'm flying to Brisbane this afternoon. I'm launching my brand up in, in Brisbane tomorrow. And she goes, well, no one really says no to Alan. I said, oh. I said, can you just let Alan know? No. <laughs> now, if he, if he run today, I'd drop my bundle. But I had no idea who the bloke was, you know. So anyway, I get off the phone. About 10 minutes later, she rings back. She goes, he's agreed to do it over the phone. Good on you, Alan. Like, whoop de doo the following morning, I'm in my sister-in-law's house. Phone rings, the interview went something like this, blah, 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 $50, blah, 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 $50, you're a legend, $50. Got off the phone and she said, how was that? I said, I don't know, I kept on talking about this whole $50 thing. To me, it was no big deal. Because like when you're 25 years old and you've got $1.25 in the bank, you don't tell anyone because it doesn't assist you in picking up the chicks. So you keep on the down low. But the media thought it was fantastic. So I thought, well, that was nice. Got off the phone. What I could do? Done on a radio interview. Woohoo. Ten minutes later, the phone rings. I said, hello. The lady goes, hello, it's a current affair. Now, when a current affair ring you, you shit yourself. <laughs> I didn't touch her. I was nowhere near her. Because I always do stories on Dodgy Brothers, right? And I said, I'm not dodgy. They said, no, 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 we just heard you on Alan Jones. And I stupidly said, oh, do people listen to him? Yeah. <laughs> They said, um, we want to do a story. And I said, oh, OK. So they did. About six weeks later, well, they filmed it. And about six weeks later, it went on air. In the first 30 minutes of it going on a current affair, 187 stores rang me to put my brand into their store. And that day I decided I was never going to spend a single cent on advertising, and I never have. I use, some people say manipulate, tomato, tomato, the media to grow my business. There's great opportunities out there if you want to grow your business. This is one thing I teach my um, clients when I mentor them on how to get media attention. I'm going to give you a big, those people would like to get media attention, I'm going to give you a big heads up right now. Some people might know about this website. There's a website called sourcebottle.com.au, S-O-U-R-C-E. Media are very lazy now. They, in the olden days, you, they'd have to do research to find content on a story. Now they list their stories on this website, it's free, and they advertise who they'd like to sort of interview. And you can pick, and, and twice a day, an email comes to your desktop or whatever you use, um, and you can, it's all different categories all over the place. And it's worldwide too. I, was, I got um, an interview in Forbes magazine by just, they wanted something on Australian entrepreneurs, and they said, yeah, I'm one. Um, and that was it. So that's a really good website. But I, that's where, see, media feed off media. And it's, that's for, so that was in 1995. And every year so far, up until still to today, every year there'll be at least five or six major media, whether it's current affairs, like I'm now doing stuff with, um, I'm not sure if anyone's seen it, on Koshy's business show. I've, I've done two um, reporting things on that now, um, mentoring um, different clients and stuff like that. 
and that reaches, I don't know, 600,000 people. And so from being on that show, then gives me newspaper stuff. And you start getting into that space. See, we need to, see, being an entrepreneur is not so much, and not only about growing your business. I hate the word entrepreneur, I've got to tell you. I hate when people refer to themselves as one. I hope I'm not going to offend anyone. A numbnut gave me his card the other day, and his description, his job description, was entrepreneur. I think you're an idiot. Anyway, if you've got one of them, don't give me a card. But no, being entrepreneurial is not just about running a business. You've got to be entrepreneurial about the way you think. So when it comes to running a business, I actually don't work that hard. Because I'm sitting there going, hmm, how do I find the shortcut? And it will take me a long time to find a shortcut. So this is where, for me, I can go and spend a gazillion dollars. See, Current Affair back in those days was about three and a half million viewers. For four, four minutes and 36 seconds, that story was. Now they're a lot shorter, the stories. But four minutes and 36 seconds. How much do you reckon it's going to cost to advertise in a newspaper to have the impact that that would have had for four and a half something? You couldn't pay for it, could you? But I got it for free. I, I get everything. For, I love freebies. Get everything for free. So we've got to start thinking about how do we get this stuff for free. Either This is my whole theory, and this upsets some people when I say this. Either I have a Harley or I work my ass off and give someone else my money. Harley, someone else gets my money. Anyone else getting this? Harley, someone else gets my money. This is where we've got to start going, you know what, I want to give someone else my money. I want to take my kids or my, my family on a holiday. I want to take my wife out for dinner. I want to actually, you know, save the world. Whatever you want to do, or give someone else some money. We've got to start being entrepreneurial in our thinking. I don't want anyone else to get my money. You know, the more money I make, the more money I can give away. Not to people that are going to grow my business, but to people who actually need it. Makes sense to me, but what do I know? Um, anyway, so the media. So then a current affair, and my business took off big time. And I'm sitting in my garage. Oh, before I tell you that story, you've heard other speakers today. You know sometimes speakers start telling a story, and you go, what the, where the hell are you going with the story? I'm going nowhere with this next story. Just thought I'd let you know right from the start. <laughs> But the one thing that I love about my own success from a me-me perspective is I now get away with everything that I used to get in trouble for when I was a kid. Yeah. It's way cool. <laughs> you know the bizarre thing too? Everything that I've used to get to here was everything that I was told at school would be the reason why I'd never make it. It's bizarre that, isn't it? I love my... Uh, I got kicked out of school in year nine, which is not really good when your dad's the principal of the Bible college, but that's okay. <laughs> Um, but my uh, English teacher told me, uh, Harold, you'll amount to nothing. I've written eight international best-selling books now, so every time one comes out, I send him a copy. <laughs> you dick. Um, anyway, that wasn't the story I was going to tell. Um, so I get away with everything that I used to get in trouble for. Now, my friends and I, we've all grown up since we were 14 together. We're, we're all best of mates. It, it's one of those... You, you've probably got people that you've had around for a long time. All of my friends have been around together, all of my mates. It's just great to do life with people. And we, I remember having a conversation back when, I don't know, probably about 16, 17, over a cup of tea, um, about, I'm not sure if anyone else had this conversation, but what would ever happen if we get older and make money? We had one of them conversations. And we decided back then that if that was the case and we got married, our wives could do latte and we will do dickhead. We decided we never wanted to grow up, and we never have. <laughs> I can't stand serious people. So anyway, we play practical jokes on each other. We always have, we always do, and it happens every week. My, has anyone ever watched The Simpsons? I love The Simpsons. Yeah. But when Bart rings up the pub to pretend he's someone else, we've been doing that for years, right? <laughs> so my uh, largest speaking job so far was a little bit bigger than this, was 37,500 people in America. So I was on my way to the airport, the sun was shining, the birds were singing, all was happy and gay. I was in one of those bulletproof moods, you know, driving down the freeway. My phone rings. I said, hello. And there's a guy with an American accent. He goes, is that Justin Harrell? I said, yes. He goes, it's such and such, the people I was speaking for. I said, oh, I can't wait. This is going to be great. Because when you speak in front of that many people, you're a rock star. Um, anyway, enough about my ego. Um, so anyway, he goes, um, I said, I'm so excited. He goes, look. We've done a survey last night and no one really wants to hear anything you have to say, so we've decided to cancel your flight, so next year's probably going to be better for you. Hung up the phone. <laughs> I won't tell you what I said right then. I was no longer happy and gay. 
Then I'm going through my phone, in my, my book in my car to find the company over here that booked me to speak over there. You ever done the angry doll? Stupid people! About to hit the last number. My phone rings, I said, hello. It's all my mates sitting around a speakerphone going, suck, dude. <laughs> <laughs> See, they had um, one of my other mates was next to me in a neighbour's rental car. I didn't know it was him because it's not his car, so I'm not even looking at the car. So he's on the phone to them going, ring him now. <laughs> so they're all trying to get me back because I am the king, right? I, I've even got the trophy, which I can't tell you what the trophy is, but I've got the trophy because I am the king of this whole thing and they're trying to get the trophy off. My brother is a landscaper. Dean's a very famous landscaper. Dean's won the Chelsea Garden Show. He's won your Melbourne Garden Show here numerous times. Um, he wins everything. He's designing for the Sultan of Brunei's garden. Uh, we call that a state over here, but um, very, very good. Dean's average job for your backyard's about two and a half million dollars, right? A lot of grass. So anyway, and but everyone thinks he's my older brother because he's always serious all the time. So I'm at a party one night, talking to some chick who was boring the crap out of me. So it looked like I was listening to what she was saying, but listening to the conversation behind me, it was my brother and my father talking. And Dean said to my dad, oh, I'm making so much money. He goes, nothing ever goes wrong for me anymore. Then he comes out with a perler. He goes, I'm in the zone. <laughs> I thought, you're a little peck ahead. I'm going to get you out of your zone. All right. <laughs> so the following day, I ring up a local landscape supplier. And I said to them, what's your smallest truck? They said, oh, two ton. I said, wonderful. I said, how many of them do you have? They said, oh, we've got 15 of those. I said, perfect. I said, can I get um, 15 two-ton trucks to deliver 15 piles of sand across the front lawn, please? And they said, we could do that in one truck. They said, you can, there's one pile. I want 15 piles. <laughs> so I paid for it all. And then I said, um, and then I said oh, does your trucks go beep, beep? And they said, they have to, it's the law. I said, wonderful, can they reverse up the driveway, please? <laughs> so then I faxed him stuff I wanted to say, paid for it all. Following day, Dean's around the back of the house that they were doing, and the house was huge. It blocked the sun out for four suburbs, but they're around the back of this house, and all of a sudden they hear this. <laughs> so they run around the front thinking, what the hell's going on? And there's 15 poles of sand, 14 trucks are driving away, one truck driver left. And Dean walks up to the truck driver, and he goes, mate, I think you got the wrong house. <laughs> no. And Dean said, I didn't order any sand. No, he didn't. <laughs> Dean said, who ordered the sand? Looks like it's your brother Justin. <laughs> Dean said, why did Justin order sand? The guy goes, well, you've got nothing to do, nothing ever goes wrong anymore, and you're in your zone. Move your sand. <laughs> he got in his car, truck, truck and drove off. I won't tell you what Dean called me right then. I do know one thing for a fact, it takes a long time to get rid of 30 tonne of sand if you don't own a ute. Right? Anyway, we play dumb jokes. There's a point behind this, right? All this media at attention's happening. Everything's going off. My business is going to the next point. You know that people go, oh, I don't know what I'm going to do if my business gets bigger and what do, what do we do? What do we do? People just, you know, people think too much. The, the people that they look like they've got constipation. <laughs> They're just thinking too much. You know, sometimes you just got to hang on for the ride and we don't know, you don't know if you're actually going to be very good at organising growth and all that, you don't know. So don't fret over something you don't know about because you, be, you might rock at it. So anyway, business is going through the roof. And I get this phone call, I'm sitting in my garage. A lady said, hello, it's Phillips. We would love to licence your brand. And I said, well, you can get stuffed. Hung up the phone. She rings back, she goes, we, we must have got cut off. <laughs> I said, no, I hung up the phone and here it comes again. Come on. <laughs> See, I thought it was one of my friend's wives trying to get me on the phone thing. It wasn't. She rings back for the third time. She goes, don't hang up the phone. I'm thinking, oh, crap, it's a real person. She goes, why did you hang up the phone? I told her about the practical joke thing. She goes, oh, that is so funny. <laughs> yes. She goes, come in tomorrow, want to license your brand. I said, no dramas whatsoever. Now, I used to be married to a woman, but I used to be married. And my ex-wife has had, and still has, this disease that I think most women have. And that disease is... She just had to know who was on the phone to all the time. Freaking annoying from a bloke's perspective. Because you start telling them and they go, oh, I don't care. Well, why ask? So I get off the phone. She goes, who was that? I said, that's Phillips. She goes, what do they want? I said, they want to license my brand. She said, what's licensing? I said, I've got absolutely no idea. I'll find that out tomorrow. I want to close on 
um, we'll finish on the, the whole principle of opportunity. There's all these funky words out in the marketplace these days. Focus, commitment, character. All these words get thrown out all the time. Opportunity. Like, most people don't even know what the hell it is. The amount of people that sit in front of me, the first thing that comes out of their mouth in the first session that they ever do with me is, I'm waiting for the next opportunity for my business. An opportunity is something you've never had before. So if you haven't had it, how do you know what it looks like when it's coming past? I think people would like their business to grow a certain way. What happens if it's going to grow another way? Well, that's why we've got to actually not be too hard and fast on what we, the direction we would like to go. That's why I don't do business plans, just the way I work. Because that's the great, that's a wish list. That's what would be good to happen. What happens is it going to happen this way? I'm going to prove that to you. So the following day, I had to go to the Phillips head office meeting. Marty was over for some reason, I can't remember why. I had a bit of a girly moment because I didn't know what to wear because I'd never been to a meeting before. So Marty, we were talking about it for ages and he goes, well, what did they say on the phone? I said, well, they said they saw me on a current affair. He goes, where would you have on a current affair? Good thinking. So I went to my meeting with thongs on, holes in my jeans before it was trendy and an attitude t-shirt. Get to Phillips head office. I walk into the reception area and I was in boy heaven. Gadgets. I love buttons. If there's an option for one of my cars to have a, a button, it doesn't have to be connected. I just love the button thing. But TVs, stereos, mobile phones, all over the place. I went up to the receptionist. I said, hello, I'm... She goes, oh, you're the bald man they tell me to look out for. <laughs> I felt like saying, you're really fat. <laughs> but I didn't. I kept that one internal. She goes, follow me. They're expecting you. So off she goes, like two elephants fighting under a blanket. <laughs> so she walks off. As we're walking down this corridor, this guy comes out of his office and goes, you're here. <laughs> yeah. Shook my hand, he went back in his office. <laughs> Kept on walking a bit further. Another guy comes out of his office, he goes, oh, I've been dying to meet you. So mate, me too, me too, how you going? Back in his office. I think, is this how meetings are done now? Like, <laughs> Kept on walking, I said to the lady, how do they know who I am? She goes, I don't know, I'm just the receptionist. Sour sack of a lady. She'd been sucking lemons most of her life, I reckon. <laughs> Get to these two double doors. She flings open the double doors. I walk in the world's biggest boardroom with the world's longest boardroom table down the middle and 34 men in suits staring at me. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever been somewhere and you can physically feel yourself leave your comfort zone? <laughs> now, I'm going to have to do this story really fast now because my time's nearly out. So anyway... You've got to do the whole handshakey thing, right? So, and you know the one thing I suck at? Like, I'm really, really comfortable doing this. When I'm not doing this, I'm actually... People don't get it. If I don't know you, I'm really shy. Like, I, I'm not... Like, if I... Yeah, I'm just... Like, you get into a cab, I don't talk. Get into a lift that I don't own, I don't talk. Because I'll say something dumb. I'll go... No, my head will go, no, 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 no. All that. So I suck at it. So the first guy comes up to me and goes, it's a beautiful day. Crap, I was going to use that one. <laughs> Next guy comes up and he goes, I'll never forget this. He goes, my wife bought me this tie just for our meeting. Really? <laughs> <laughs> oh, a cough. Excuse me. <coughs> Next guy comes up, <coughs> does his handshake with his hands on top of my hand, which apparently means he's more dominant or something. Like, yeah. take my leg, mate, I don't care. <laughs> Shook everyone's hand. They said, would you like to sit down here? I said, yes, I would. So they sit me on this side of the table and they all sit on the other side of the table. And they're straight into the meeting. No, the reason we've asked you to come here, none of that, straight into the meeting. It's an hour long meeting. About five, ten minutes into it, I'm thinking, you got the wrong guy. It's got nothing to do with me. What do I do? Just pretend that you're interested, Justin. <laughs> 45 minutes into the meeting, they said, so what do you reckon? I said, I don't know, what's it going to cost me? They said, no, 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 we pay you to put your attitude on our stereos and televisions and then give you a royalty for every single one that's sold. I said, why would you do that? They said, that's licensing. I said, look, I don't understand what licensing is. Then their lawyer said, so you don't understand licensing? I'll say, I'll say it again for you slowly, mate. Oh, I don't understand licensing. <laughs> I'll give you the Justin Herald interpretation of licensing. It, the most valuable as, uh, part of your business, the most valuable asset you have in your business is your intellectual property. Your business name is the most important thing. Not your turnover, not your... Um, what's that thing? What do they call that? Um, 
No, you know. Ah, uh, crap, I've just forgot. I'm getting old. <laughs> to you too. <laughs> um, you know, I forget it. Um, so the most valuable thing is your name. So most people get a business name, but they don't go and trademark it. You need to trademark your name, right? And I'd done that. It's very wise. I've always had to surround myself with smarter people. So I trademarked it in Australia. I didn't know why. I was just told to do it. Sometimes you're going to get advice. Just do it. So anyway, and because I had ownership over that word here in Australia, and I said, listen, I thought that I had to pay you. They said, no. I said, look, no, no, now. But because I thought that then, I haven't listened to a single thing you've said. <laughs> so if you wouldn't mind, can we start all over again? And you could hear the collective, you're an idiot. <laughs> so they started all over again. The reason Phillips wanted to do this is because they wanted, my, number one, my name, but they wanted my market share. They wanted the 18 to 25 year olds to buy their product because they had my name on it. So anyway, they started t talking again and then the penny dropped. <gasps> I'm in the driver's seat. Now, if my friends were here, they'd back me up. But I've never done anything for money. That's just a byproduct of doing a good job. I was happy with $1.25. But if you give me something for free, love freebies. So I'm thinking, what can I get for free? Excuse me. I said, so you want me to put, you want to put my name on your stereos and televisions? Yeah. Cool. Can I get a television as part of this deal? <laughs> they said, no problem, and kept on talking. <laughs> I'm stuck at no problem. <laughs> I've got a free television. This is fantastic. Just, just one more thing. They said, yes, what's that? You've got to repeat yourself just in case they didn't hear right. I said, so you're giving me a free... Oh, yeah. I said, so do you want me to sign the deal today? Oh, yeah. Can I get a stereo to go on my television then? <laughs> no problem. So they get to it. And then they get to the end of it. They said, so what do you reckon? I said, I'll do that. They said, you want to think about it? I said, no, I'm getting a free TV and free stereo. There's nothing to think about. <laughs> then they said, would you like to negotiate? I said, didn't we just do that? <laughs> they said, no, we pay you as well. I was stuck on that. Oh, I love freebies. I said, well, okay, well, let's negotiate. <laughs> so what are you doing? They said, well, you start. I said, I'm not starting. You start. Oh, we won't start. You start. You start. You start. You start. You start. <laughs> said, I'm happy with the TV and stereo. You start. Now, I'm in a huge room by myself. I'm expecting them to say, would you excuse us and just step outside for a minute? No. They all get up and go to the corner. <laughs> now, I'm at the table now entirely by myself. And I can't look in their direction because they've got the group spy looking at me to make sure I'm not looking in their direction. Not looking. <laughs> and they come back and some people say dumb stuff. They get back to the table and they sit down and they said, We've had a discussion. <laughs> oh, I was here. <laughs> they pull out a piece of paper, they write a figure down the back of this piece of paper, put it face down the world's longest slippery boredom table and slip it across. Now, as we know in business, it's all about staying calm and being collected. I know that because I'm a businessman. So I pick up my piece of paper. How you going? Beautiful day. Nice tie. Phew, kidding me. <laughs> now, has anyone ever seen a number and it's so big that it's quicker to count the commas? Now, I can't tell you the exact figure, but it was more than three times my second year's turnover. Big number. I am the king of the dumb question. Always have been, always will be. First dumb question. Is that a full stop or a comma? <laughs> they said, that's a full stop. That was a three-year deal. So I said, this gets paid over three years. I said, no. They said, that's per year. Ah. <laughs> Top half of my body was calm, underneath. <laughs> do you know, I was looking around the room right then, thinking, do any of you look like a relative of any of my mates? Because this is a cracker if this is a setup. <laughs> <laughs> then I asked the dumb question. I said, you know how I'm getting that free TV and free stereo? They said, oh yeah. I said, does it come out of this price at all? <laughs> they said, no, no, that's free. Then Harry Van Dyke, who was a worldwide CEO of Phillips, comes out of his office, who has been my mentor since that day. You want to reach somewhere you've never been, get people, get someone who's been there and done it in spades. I'm going to continually say that. Anyway, he comes out and he goes, oh, I like doing business with you. I like doing business with you too. 
Now this is three hours into my one hour meeting. They give me my check. Some people do not have a sense of humour because it's a big check. I said, do you reckon I could get like one of those big novelty checks? <laughs> you know the reaction? <laughs> I said, that was funny. I'm telling you that was funny. So they give me my check. I get to the door and I went, hang on. They all froze. I said, where's my TV and stereo? <laughs> I said, we'll deliver that. I said, bugger that for a joke. I said, I've been here for three and a bit hours. They said, we know. I said, yeah, no, 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 you're, not, you're missing my point. When I left home, my ex-wife said to me, how long will you be? I said, well, the meeting goes for an hour, hour and a half, I'd say. She said, well, make sure you come back straight away. I go, well, I've got nothing else to do. She goes, don't go to the pub. I wasn't going to go to the pub. Please don't go to the pub. Still not going to the pub. I'm telling you, don't go to the pub. I'm going to go to the pub now because I will need to go to the pub after this stupid conversation, but I'm not going to the pub. But if I come back after three and a half hours, four hours, and walk in, she's going to go, you've been to the pub. I go, no, I haven't been to the pub. I've been to this meeting. No, you haven't. It wouldn't take that long. I said, it took that long. She'd then say, why did it take so long? I'll say, I said this, I said this, then I said this, and she's going to go, you're an idiot. But if I walk in with a television, the first thing she's going to go is, you're a legend. So I'd rather be the legend than the idiot. And you can see half the guys in the room going... <laughs> I said, so I'll take it with me now. And they said, we don't have any here. I said, yes, you do. They said, no, we don't. I said, yes, you do. They said, no, we don't. I said, yes, you do. They said, where? I said, out in the foyer. I said, the sour sack of a lady you got sitting out there, all she's doing is watching all these TVs. I'll take one of them off the wall. I don't care. <laughs> then they said, we don't have a box. I said, I don't care if you don't have a box because I don't want a box. Because if I take this home in a box for the next three and a half weeks, I'll cut up in little pieces to put it in my whiz bin. Halfway through that process, I'm going to go to my, my wife, oh, I'm going to wait for the next council cleanup day. And she's going to go, you better not forget. Because if I'm going to freaking forget, you're going to remind me about it every five seconds, aren't you? But then I'm probably going to be away on the weekend of the council cleanup day. So instead of her going, oh, look, he's left that very light box out the front, let me go and put it out the front on the grass and put it there. No, she's going to leave it there to teach me a lesson. So when I get home, instead of her saying, thank you so much for working for me and Jimmy Choo, no, I'm not going to get that. I'm going to get the, you forgot your box. And what the fuck, your box in the first place. And half the guys are in there going, I said, so I'll take it now. They said, okay, no box, no box. So I went out there and I said, I'll have that TV, I'll have that stereo. Guy puts it in bubble wrap. I said, goodbye, everyone. I said, yep, yep, yep. And you, mate. Walk, walk to my car. Look in the back of my car, there's all this TV and stereo stuff. Got the big check in my hand. And I did something that most people forget to do now. Can anyone remember the first day you started your business at all in the room? Anyone remember the first person that ran? It's exciting, right? But now, we're business people. We don't get excited anymore. It's bizarre, that. I get excited about everything. It's bizarre when you walk onto a plane and you can see you, yourself on a front cover of a book looking back at you. That's weird. But I get excited about everything. See, excitement leads to passion and passion that people produce. So you've got to get excited. So I'm an outside excitement, outwardly excited, I'm finishing, outwardly excited person. So I'm doing the whole... <laughs> and I look up and here they all are. Just in closing, you know, the reality is most people would not have gone to that meeting. You know why? Because they didn't know what it was about. I'll give you everyone in this room, I don't care how long you've been in business, 100% one, uh, guarantee in what I'm about to say. Your future has got, does not have a great deal to do with what you currently know. Because if it did, you'd already be there by now. So there's more stuff we need to learn. I'm still learning more stuff. I surround myself with smarter people to this day. That's how you get to success. All that from a stupid woman telling me I had an attitude problem. Bizarre, eh? It's not rocket science, this whole thing. As I said before, I now own 18 businesses. I do a lot of mentoring with people and, and I speak for a living, which is bizarre. I used to get in trouble at school for talking. Now I get paid for it.